recording of an interrogation of Ms. Coker, and it was very harmful to Mr. Lee. The part that was, that was released that, that I am aware of, and I believe Mr. Adams would like to correct me, just has lies, lots of people can say lies, about Mr. Williams ordering people to die. It was very harmful. I asked Judge Glanville, the predecessor judge, for relief and a bond because it, it, did, it denied Mr. Williams' right to a fair trial. The predecessor judge said there's going to be an independent investigation to release that and that he would get to the bottom of it. I never heard back from that. A jail call, I listened to all these jail calls. We had others listen to all these jail calls. On the jail call, I didn't, I didn't say anything last week. I played the jail call where Mr. Copeland said that immediately after telling the authorities in December and February, December 22, December 23, that he had lied and that um, everything he said was a lie about Mr. Um, Williams, that he was telling this to his friend and his sister, he said all of a sudden, this jail call, uh, excuse me, this interrogation is released. So he believed it was the prosecution team releasing. That's how it all came up. For a prosecutor who's an advocate to then vouch for and put her own credibility in issue, that's what I've been objecting to. And to say, we gave it to the defense. I'm raising my voice because I don't have an um, amplifier or microphone. So I'm not, I'm not trying to yell or, or take your head with a smile. Um, my point is, and I'm sorry, Your Honor, is that it sounds like I did something wrong. I didn't release anything. I didn't do anything wrong. I was the one objecting to the release of this information. And it was given out, and I'm not very technical, so it was given out of Dropbox, and I was told I could barely do it. And Judge Glanville, then the predecessor judge, said, don't do it that way anymore. He had to Dropbox, it was never taken down. It was all a mess. And the predecessor judge, and I'm not asking this person, they may have been a great investigator. I just never heard anything. Now we hear on Tuesday, the third day of September, and the prosecution is asking questions which clearly target that did you know that within X amount of time that the defense got this discovery, which the previous answer was no. I don't know when the defense got this discovery. There's no foundation. That doesn't stop the district attorney of saying then it was released. Clearly, it's the same pattern that they've been given about the Owens witnesses, Mr. Dontavia Stevens, Mr. Keene, D-E-A-N, Mr. Murphy, this witness. Have you ever had to testify in front of Jeffrey Williams or these other people? Now all of a sudden, your testimony is different. And I've been objecting every time because there's no evidence of intimidation. And what happens is you may not know. And this is based on information belief. I never spoke with Mr. Copeland about this, but maybe it's not true. I believe he got beaten in the jail after that was released. I believe that. I could be wrong. But assuming that's all true, for the prosecutor to now say that their hands are clean, and I can't ask the question. Judge Glanville denied my request to call the prosecutors and their agents to um, assert under oath, under questioning, who released it. Because it certainly wasn't in Mr. Williams' head, Mr. So anybody on Mr. Williams' behalf would be a, um, would do a disservice to release that Mr. Williams was having people killed when we were in the middle of the jury for that. So anyway, my bottom line is this. This entire, Ms. Hilton has taken, and I have all the cases we argued before, but has taken herself, and she has moved from the position of asking questions as an advocate to testifying as a witness. You told me I was there. Detective walked out of the car. You told me. You only told me this. Did you know that the prosecution served this? Did you, were you aware that the defense had this? All of this needs to be questioned to see if the prosecutor is open. So I ask the court, I know I've been repeating in asking that, and I know that I've been objecting, but this is not how we try cases in the state of Georgia. All of these cases require the show to take a witness stand. And if she does, I have no objection to on her witness. I'm not trying to stymie the prosecution. They have other witnesses. They have, they have at counsel's table, they have three other lawyers. I mean, this is not new. So I ask that the prosecution has specifically Ms. Hilton and Ms. Love to be removed from the case. I have questions for both of them. I also want to renew my 
That wasn't going to be my next question because I didn't know he got beat up in the jail. Your Honor, last week when Mr. Shard, I believe, asked. Still, let me just correct you there. It, it may not have. That may not be accurate. I, I, don't, I don't have any personal knowledge where I was not told that. Last week when Mr. Shard asked, Ms., he went down a line of questioning about this call being released. And Mr. Shard asked Mr. Copeland who, who was his belief, what was his belief of who released this recording. And the state objected, saying that it wasn't relevant who he believed, who he believed released this video. The court overruled the state's objection. He was able to answer that question, which was he believed it was the state. And at this point, we believe that it is proper for the same reason that he was able to disparage that the state will release such a video. Okay. You need to be careful about what you're saying because there are questions from the attorneys and then there are answers from the witness stand, and that's what the evidence is. And I do not believe that anybody on the defense side made the suggestion that the state had released it. I mean, the transcript will reflect what was asked and what was answered. And maybe not disparage is the right word, but the question was asked, who do you believe released the video? And he says, I believe it was the state of Georgia. I believe that an appropriate line of questioning, Your Honor, is would he feel differently if he thought that the defense leaked it? And to give questioning about what his understanding of what Mr. Copeland's understanding is of what happened and what transpired when this video was released. Well, we already know what Mr. Copeland's belief and understanding is. But would it change if... That's not what you asked, though. But I had to give some foundational questions in order to ask that question, in order to ask what my next question is. Because another question I'm going to ask him, and it's something he alluded to earlier, was that after this video was released, Ms. Love, Investigator Long, Ms. Rolex all visited with him after this video was released to check on him, to make sure that he was okay. And he alluded to that earlier when he thought I was present at the meeting. And all of this happened around the time that the video was leaked. And so I was asking some foundational questions to Mr. Copeland to see if his position would be different if he thought that someone else leaked it and not the state of Georgia. Then you should have asked that question. And I can get to that series of questions, Your Honor, but I don't... I mean, you are coming very, very close to the line with this line of questioning. I mean, you're basically... The defense is not far off. Let's just put it that way. So I can move to my last two questions regarding this, which is who came to visit him after the video was released, and would he feel differently if he believed that the defense leaked the video? No, I'm not going to let you ask that last question at this point. And that's a total hypothetical question. That is an assumes facts, not an evidence question. Not the objection you keep making. Your Honor, I feel compelled to just make a brief record. First of all, any insinuation that I asked a question about the release is way off. That topic never even came up during my cross. You know what? And let me... I know you're not finished, but let me just say that I believe that this jury is paying attention and that they have enough wherewithal to remember what actually happened. And for questions that are potentially misleading, I'm not sure why they're being asked, but I think the jury is going to take note of what got said. And I understand, but I think the jury is doing what they have been told to do, which is to pay attention to the evidence, not the questions. And second, Your Honor, I just want Your Honor to understand kind of the backdrop here. I guess there was a release. I wasn't... I don't even remember the time that it was released, but apparently it was on social media. When that came to the attention of the court, the court, to my recollection, from my vantage point, yelled at the defense 
and this was prior judge, and essentially blamed us. And all of us were saying, well, we didn't do anything. I personally don't even know how to release a video to the, to the press or the, the Internet anyways. But, you know, I just went along with it. Okay, there's going to be an investigation. We're being told we're under investigation. Um, and then all of a sudden, no one mentions the investigation anymore. And it's kind of like, well, if you're accused of something, you would like to know the progress of said investigation. I'm like, certainly happy to ask the and, predecessor and, well, court's chambers what's going on with it, if anything. But that's not really relevant well, to what's before this jury. Well, it's not until the state, knowing that there was an investigation, knowing that they haven't heard of any findings, then re, you know, lights this thing on fire again and and starts suggesting that we did something wrong and you know i can only speak for myself i i don't believe anyone did anything wrong on this side i know i didn't and then somehow those insinuations are coming out in front of the jury with absolutely no basis and i'm going to join my um my friend mr Steele, and and i'm going to state in my place that I believe the state at this point is goading a mistrial and, and, and goading us to move for a mistrial. So I, I just think that that was very inappropriate and it, it, it suggested things that there is just no basis. And in fact, there's been, apparently been an investigation and it's been settled as far as I know. Well, I don't know what has happened, if anything, with that. But would you like to address the um assertion that you are goading the defense into a mistrial? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, number one. Or into a motion for mistrial. Yes, Judge. Thank you. Number one, we don't want a mistrial. We um, vehemently object to a mistrial, and we do believe that the line of questioning, whether it was posed by Mr. Sharp or Mr. Steele regarding Mr. Copeland's belief about who leaked that video, um, was one, not relevant, but understanding that the court ruled as it did, um, we believe that um, an inquiry whether his belief that the state leaked the video had some impact on how he decided to testify would be a valid question. And since that's, again, asked. not what y'all asked. Understood, Judge, understood. But I vehemently object to a mistrial I do not believe that anyone here at this table has done anything, anyone at this table or on the state's behalf has done anything to in any way merit, warrant, call for, justify a mistrial. So we definitely object to a mistrial. And um, Your Honor, as it relates to the assertion that counsel for the state have somehow made themselves a witness repeatedly um, the witness has affirmed that there were people in the room whom either counsel for the defense could call without having to disqualify either prosecutor in this case. So that being obvious, we definitely object to a mistrial and um, additionally we object to the speaking objections that are being made while the jury is in the box. All right, well, I'm going to overrule that objection. I don't think that that is going on. Um, sometimes it's just not particularly clear what the objection is, and if I need further elucidation, then I have permitted that. But um, I'm going to overrule the motion for mistrial and um, or deny the motion for mistrial and deny the motion to remove um, either Ms. Hilton or Ms. Love from the case. Um, I do think that it appears from the questions that there was somebody else present at every meeting. Um, but, you know, Ms. Hilton, that's another option as well. Yes, ma'am. I can't hear you. Okay. All right. Can you try that one? All right, can you hear me? That works. All right. Your Honor, I want to add that we cannot question any other individual that was at that meeting about Ms. Hilton and the way that she asked some of her questions and made her comments. Let me give you an example. Ms. Hilton said, I was standing to the side 
because I didn't know you. That's her feelings. That's her reasoning on why she was standing where she was standing. Ms. Hilton also said, I was just being me. I can't ask detective anyone in okay. reference to that. I, I, she, I, she, I, hang on. Sorry. I mean, I think that each of those was not a statement. It was a question. It was a cross-examination question. They weren't, they were, and was this essentially like, is this your recollection or is this what happened? So it was not her testifying. I'm overruling that objection. All right. And I just want to add that she also said the purpose of the ex parte meeting. So there's no Which way that he, he said, I have no idea what the purpose of that meeting was. So, I mean, I understand, but it's, it's overruled. Thank you for the additional uh, making of the record. Anything else? All right, thank you. Okay, let's um, go ahead and um, take our restroom break as well. And let's try to be back as quickly as possible because the jury's already been out for 15 minutes. <laughs> 